Is everyone wrong about U.S. rates? Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. With me today is Harry Melandri, advisor at MI2 Partners. Hi, Harry. It's great to see you. Hi, Maggie. It's always good to see you. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Uh, so if we look across the markets today, a little bit mixed. Um, we had uh, the Dow uh, up, but S&P and Nasdaq kind of drifting down. Treasury yields creeping back up as was the US dollar, but you know, pretty muted overall. And, and, and I'm interested to get your thoughts because as we sort of have gone through the last weeks, you hear a lot of different perspectives. And our pro members know that you have the incredibly difficult job of moderating, some might say playing referee, on our monthly Macro Insider show that Raul and Julian do. And I know the three of you have been going back and forth about what's happening in the economy. And I want to play a clip from that and then break down your macro outlook on the other side. Let's have a listen. The risk is, is that you have actually a shrinking labor force and, and uh, or l- at least not a growing one in an environment where we're trying to re-accelerate, where nominal GDP is not shrinking much, uh, it'll come down a wee bit, uh, but, that, but inflation has dropped a fair bit. And so you just play this mix between either higher inflation or higher real growth, and higher real growth is just not, uh, we've never seen a real sustainable acceleration in higher real growth huh. with from 3.6% unemployment. And I don't see that labor force increasing uh, oh. until either you, you, you know, we have some bloody miracle or you get, you smash equities to the point that all those retirees come back. Right. And until AI kicks in, that could be two years, three years in real economic terms. And that's a lifetime. Uh, Raul, um, what happens to your thesis if the Fed holds rates at current levels uh, to 2024? Zero in terms of asset price performance generally. Um, the issue where that would test my everything code thesis is the interest payments on the debt. If we don't see a balance sheet increase to deal with that, then something structurally has changed that allows for the payment of those debts. Now, could it be to do with Julian's idea about nominal growth? I think real growth is actually the, 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 the underlying factor behind the interest payments, but maybe there's not. So that's what it will do is test that thesis about the liquidity thesis and the fact that interest payments get monetized. And that full episode is on our website. Raul, Julian, and Harry put each other to the test once a month on our pro tier. You can check it out there. And Harry, um, Jordan, we obviously have a few viewers. Uh, lots of people happy to see you roll up on the daily briefing, as are we always. And Jordan said, we need a show filled with Harry's dad jokes. I, I agree with that. Because <laughs> he was just doing it while we were the clip was I running, Jordan. Even, you have ESP. I, I, <laughs> I didn't even know there were dad jokes. This is, I've been talking about that. that is a whack and a half. So if, as long as the glare from my forehead, expanding forehead, isn't blinding you, Maggie, I'm happy to talk about any of this macro stuff. So, All right. So let's so 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 let's pick up from that because you and and early on you um, and we know Raul and Julian have slightly different views. Sometimes it's just because their time frame is different, but. I think that in that show, you've all been unearthing the fact that there's there are a couple different sort of narratives out there. They're often competing with each other, whether we look at growth, whether we look at inflation, whether we look at the direction of interest rates. Everybody can't be right. So how are you thinking about this? So first of all, I, I like the point that Raul made. Um, I, of course, I work with Julian all the time. I love Julian's work and is, you know it's core to what we do and everything. But uh, the, I thought the point Raul made there was was quite central, um, and it's the same point you, we have when we play musical chairs with kids. Um, the Fed tightens its balance sheet and raises rates. Monetary conditions are tightening up, and somebody somewhere is not going to have access to financing. And as that situation ratchets tighter, either they proactively ease or bad things happen to good people. Um, or perhaps financially less careful people. So I, that's, I think a lot of that is where the, the difference between Julian and Raoul's view. Um, Raoul believes the Fed will proactively ease, and Julian is arguing that there's got to be a lot of pain before the Fed is convinced enough to loosen rates. So I would characterize 
the current situation is one where we have two stories that are competing in macro markets. Um, the story number one, narrative number one, is this economy can't stand rates this high, and it's only a matter of time till the Fed kills the economy. Um, and the other story, which is out there, is we're going to have a soft landing just like in 1994. And you should imagine Jake Powell is a figure skater, and the Fed has just executed a perfect triple salco. Uh, the inflation was entirely transient, and it's now gone the way of all base effects. It's just disappeared into a puff of smoke. So you can safely buy stocks, and you don't have to worry too much about bonds. Fed can leave rates where they are to create a little bit more slack in the economy. But there's policy space to cut rates as and when it really needs to, because inflation won't get out of hand. Now, you you're can far tell- too spicy, Harry, for me to think that you're buying into that beautific scene that you just painted. <sighs> you know, I'm just a cynical man, and it's a problem for me. I miss out on some of the biggest rallies. I didn't have Nvidia. Uh, my friend Oz had Nvidia, but no, I'm an idiot. I didn't have Nvidia. So, I'm I am dubious, and I'm dubious because. Uh, first of all, there aren't many of us who can imagine Jay Powell as a figure skater. Um, <laughs> uh, but secondly, I I don't have I don't really believe scenario number one either that the economy can't stand rates as high. After all, how is that consistent with earnings results like Caterpillars today? Um, and there's just way too much macro data, which is surprising to the upside. Uh, the S and P global macro uh, global macro manufacturing PMI. Was, was surprisingly strong. It showed people with no significant um, you know, firing intentions. It's a good economy. Um, so the question is, why is it such a good economy, right? I mean, monetary policy always has winners and losers, but there seem to be more winners and fewer losers out there. And I feel for the losers, I really do. Students are going to start paying their student loans again in October. Um, they don't own real estate, they don't own stocks, they do have debts, and those debts are resetting at much higher rates. Um, not a lot of fun. Uh, so how can we explain the, the surprisingly consistent strength in the economy in the face of 525 beeps of rate hikes? I think it's got something to do with the 8.5% of GDP federal deficit. Um, we Can we put that chart up? I think we got it up, haven't we? Yeah. Which one? I think we have two. Which one, which one do you want to look at? That one you've got. That's exactly the right one. So um, I think it's kind of hard to have a recession when the government is force feeding money into the real economy um, and via the real economy into the financial markets on this scale. Um, if you think about it, um, I mean, what did I learn from COVID? I learned uh, during COVID that fiscal policy is really effective, really <laughs> effective, um, and can do amazing things. Um, so much more so in many ways in monetary policy, because you do have losers for monetary policy as well as winners and so forth and so on, winners as well as losers. So before COVID, 8.5% fiscal, 8.5% of GDP as a fiscal stimulus was about double the normal level of the deficit. Of course, COVID screwed up all the charts. Everything is, was literally off the charts when COVID happened, but, you know, we had 18%. But um, where we are, it's, it's about twice the normal level of fiscal stimulus. So perhaps we shouldn't be so shocked um, that the economy is strong, right? Um, and then you've interviewed Warren Mosler. Mm. So, you, yeah, I mean, he's, I, I'm careful with that interview because he's a, he's a tricky guy and he's clever but, yeah. uh, and easily irritated. And pe people feel really strongly. We've talked about this very tribal. This is modern monetary it, theory. It, for, it does, for those it of does. you who want to see it, we did the full interview. It was fascinating stuff. And Harry and I talked before the interview uh as well about right. it so, but it's, it's worth it it's worth listening to so you don't have to believe in mmt you can dismiss mmt completely and still take some of the observations that mosler has um and the key one where he persuaded me was when he pointed out what we were saying back in the 90s about italy do you remember when italy had a debt to gdp of like a hundred percent and everyone thought that debt might explode away to infinity well for some reason we have a debt to GDP of 100% and nobody worries about it. But, it, yeah. you know, it, it's that it, with a debt to GDP of 100%, if you've got five, go from zero to 5% interest rates, you've injected 5% interest payments into the, into the economy. It's a big effect. Um, so we shouldn't be so surprised that, um, that the economy is strong. Um, 
So this is this is I think this is really important. And, and you know, our regular viewers will know that we were we've been talking about this and, and guess some guests have been pointing it out, um, some of them a little bit more specifically and and some of them looking at some of the sort of you know companies or investments they have in the real world talking about that fiscal spending. We we passed the Infrastructure Act, right? There are all of these things, and we've been talking all last week about how we're all seeing that effect. So why it doesn't seem like people are that focused on that though? How you don't hear people talking about that that much? Why not? Is it just because it's so obvious in front of us? We've been trained to focus on the Fed to look at that particular wizard behind the curtain, magician behind the curtain, and not of what's going on in Congress. But I think that's a mistake. And I think it's much easier to understand how markets are trading and how the economy is outperforming forecasts. If you don't look at the apparently tight monetary, and there's, you know, we can argue about how tight monetary is, and the incredibly loose fiscal. So, you know, it's not, I just did some, you know, reading for Jules, and uh, I did a lot of reading on the Inflation Reduction Act. I had no idea how stimulative it was. Right. For it, it's it's an enormous bill handing out huge amounts of money. Ideally, to, if you're a chemical company, you know about this because you're making an awful lot of money out of it. These uh, handouts are big and they impact things. And you're seeing it in things like in manufacturing construction, which is a, a, a near term high. Um, sorry. And Caterpillar. I mean, look at exactly. Caterpillar today, exactly. up 8%. I also think there may be a little bit of the fact that people are so used to Washington tying themselves into knots and being unable to do anything that we're, that we're shocked that this is actually feeding directly into the economy. You could argue whether that was a good idea or a bad idea, but it doesn't change the fact that that has already happened. I think for long periods of time, we didn't have a lot of action in fiscal policy. It we was didn't. It's it been was... on the shoulders of monetary policy. Yeah. And we we pretend that the Fed's independent. Well, it's Fed's independent right up until the point the Fed does something central government doesn't want them to do, and then it won't be quite as independent anymore. Um, and I think there's a key issue there, um, because if I were trying to come to a conclusion about when uh, the economy might soften, the prerequisite would be when fiscal policy was less stimulative or when monetary policy became more aggressive. Um, the Fed just told us that it kind of thinks it's done for the time being. But I have serious doubts in the run up to the next presidential election that uh, we're going to do anything about fiscal policy until much later in 2024. Yeah, nobody in campaigns the on tightening their belt. It doesn't help. There's um, a, f a friend of mine <laughs> refers to the, uh, the uh, first iron rule of politics. My re-election matters more than anything else. And yeah. it's absolutely true. You can't pass a law unless you're in office. So it's hard for me to believe we're going to see any significant reduction in the amount of fiscal stimulus. Um, and in that case, I start asking myself, oh, dear, the Fed thinks it's almost done. And bond markets can see uh, relatively strong uh, growth. Have you seen the Atlanta Fed's latest GDP now estimate? No. What is it? Tell us. Because Harry, from, this from is the memory, of Harry is in the weeds on all of this stuff. Uh, I don't know if I call these the weeds, but I do hang around in some really boring places. It's true. It's true. So uh, the last print was 100 beeps higher than the previous one. It's like three and a half. Um, it's way above the blue chip consensus with a range of 10 economic forecasts. So the, the GDP now is telling you the growth is surprising to the upside. And again, that's happening while the Fed is telling us that the Fed's base case is, for no, long, is no longer a recession. So either we have a soft landing or perhaps we're going to have no landing at all, in yeah. which case... So this is, I think, really important, Harry. And and um, we just had someone join, uh, both Joe and uh, I think it was Ralph. What did I miss? You just mi you, you what you missed is Harry laying out why maybe everyone might be wrong on this, or at least lots of people. Because again, if we just sort of summarize that, Harry, as you point out, there are people who think that the Fed's going to stay aggressive and push us into recession, break something. 
and those who think they're going to achieve a soft landing. That camp, by the way, has really been picking up that, that narrative lately. You're talking about a third option that not many are, which is no landing at all. Just a, a robust economy. Now, I'm get, what does that do to inflation? I'm going to guess it's not, you know, to have a soft landing, you need moderating inflation. So we've all gotten very happy about the declining core inflation. It's, it has come down an awful long way, and it's now about 3%. Um, so in, sorry, headline inflation. Core inflation, uh, not so much. Um, and there are excellent reasons out there to think core inflation will come down, but some of them I just don't buy. Um, and the, uh, an example of that would be the optimism about shelter inflation. Uh, people seem to me to be confusing the first and second derivatives of shelter inflation. Now, I only wish this was my idea. It wasn't my observation. I got it from Jim Bianco. But Jim, Jim Bianco, I was in a call with Jim Bianco, and he made this observation. And I, it, I, it's immediately obvious. If you know anything about real estate, you know the, uh, the adjustment you see in rents tends to follow through because most people's rent doesn't move very much. Uh, most people's rent doesn't reset. You don't get rid of good tenants and high rates on them and residential unless, unless uh, they move out. When they move out, then you reset rents. So the increase in rents we've already seen, the upward pressure we have is likely to persist, even if the acceleration impulse is gone. We're still going to see higher than expected shelter inflation, if you ask me. Um, and that's one bet I'm really happy to take. Um, Make another observation as well, because you could think of this as like a situation where there's people who need to rent and they're in trouble, but the people who don't need to rent, they're great, they're golden. It's not true. We've got an awful lot of older people who would, if they could, choose to move to Florida. God knows why. No offense, Florida. Um, <laughs> but they, they, they want to move to Florida and they'd like to sell their big place and buy a smaller place down there, free up some cash. But with mortgage rates as they are, unless their big their current place is so much bigger than the place they intend to move to, it doesn't make any sense. So you have people living in bigger houses than they need uh, because they've got a cheap mortgage and there's no point moving. Yeah, they're trapped um, in their house. Right. And that means Jim, they're trapped, trapped, trapped with their property taxes too. But there you go. By the way, Jim uh, is going to be with us, folks, tomorrow. So we will, we will bring this up with him, Harry. So Jim... Another Jim uh, in our chat has a question. I think it's a good one. I want to insert it here. Is there a message when a good portion of the growth in GDP is derived from government spending? Does the, does the makeup of the growth matter? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to get political. I, I definitely want to avoid politics. But as we, the classic concept is crowding out, and you, you, we argue mm. that high-quality growth is seldom government-inspired growth, growth, because do you really want the government allocating resources for the economy? And you, if you do, you get a Soviet-style economy and you lose efficiency. You have um, deadweight losses. Now, the counter-argument to that is when I look at some of the, the spending program that government is, uh, is trying to catalyze with, this, with its policies, I agree, they're important. So the IRA, for example, it has bugger all to do with reducing inflation, but it does have a lot to do with stimulating uh, renewable energy. And there are huge subsidies uh, for renewable energy investment. And you know, if you if you keep these in place for any length of time, lots of people are going to go and reach out for that thirty percent tax credit, and we're going to find very cheap renewable energy at some point. That's, that's just going to happen because you've You've um, incentivized it and you've privileged it. And the problem is when you pick winners, you implicitly pick some losers too. And uh, we, some, you know, well, let's see what happens when the losers find out they've lost and are unhappy about it. Yeah. So yeah, th there's crowding out effects and the, the impact of those. So what is the implication? So now, now we have a, a, a third scenario in here where there's no landing uh, the, the economy is kind of going gangbusters. Does that mean that the Fed holds at this level or is inflation going to be problematic enough that we could actually see them moving rates higher? What's the outlook for U.S. rates? So if you sat through that entire incredibly tedious presser with Jay Powell, and, uh, you know, Lord alone knows, that was a moment when I wish he was figure skating, actually. Really. <laughs> 
Um, if you sat through it, um, you could tell that they they've gone they moved to data dependence, which means that they pre-program these rate hikes. <laughs> the, the ones we've had are obviously already they were set in stone. That's what data dependent now means. But yeah. Okay, so now they don't intend to move rates. The impression I got was they really didn't want to move them anymore. Um, and if they're forced, that's because they don't believe they have to. They don't believe they... they and it seems to me they'll be very uncomfortable. There's a higher hurdle than there has been to move rates. Now, I suspect if I say that to their face, they'll say I'm completely wrong and it's not true. But you, I just got the sense that they don't want to do more in rates. That said. Um, they will be deeply embarrassed if inflation ticks up. I think inflation will tick up from here. Um, and uh, it's an MI2 view, I think. Um, and one of the reasons why inflation will tick up is because there's a lot of stim in there. There's a lot of fiscal stim. And the US economy is tight and there's not much to loosening the tightness up. Um, it's terrible if you need to borrow money, but if you don't need to borrow money, you're receiving rates. You're, you're making money off of higher rates and you're spending it um, wherever you spend it. So, um, and if you look at commodity markets, they look like they may have bottomed. The base effects will have dropped out from the mm. start of the Ukraine-Russia war. And we've, so we've gained all of the, the kind of improvements due to lower energy prices. And right on cue, energy markets have decided to rally again. So if anything, the next impulse seems to be a higher uh, commodity prices a tighter real economy, none of this makes me feel particularly optimistic that inflation is vanquished. And I don't know if, did you see the Gita, yeah, this is where I prove that I belong in kitchens at parties, but um, did you see the Gita Gopinath uh, IMF speech at Sintra? Um, shockingly, I did not, Harry. It's funny, you, you obviously funny. hang around at different places. In but I thought she hit the nail on the head. Um, she argued that the that the inflation genie is still there, it's reduced, the problem's gone down, but most G10 economies are running too hot and have excessive fiscal policy going on simultaneously, and they need to tighten up a little bit. Um, yeah. Well, it's interesting because the headline that everyone reported out of that, which is why you have to listen and read the details like Harry does, is that global growth is better, right? I think they upgraded global growth, and that was the kind of main headline that most traditional media ran with. But the knock-on effect of that is, well, it's but, stronger, but maybe modern policy is not adequate for that. Yeah, inflation is not vanquished. They, they need to be tighter for longer. They need to do something about fiscal policy, and they, there are problems here that need to be addressed. And I think if, if this is correct, the smaller open economies have a serious problem coming to them. And places like the US are a little privileged, but they also have a similar, they've got the same problem. It's just that they have they don't depend as much on the kindness of strangers. What's the problem? Um, the mix of monetary and fiscal policy is not sufficiently tight. So they're not generating their own domestic savings, which means they're dependent on international capital market flows, which means that at some point down the line, I mean, the last 20 years or 30 years, we relied on Japan and China uh, who were saving huge amounts of their GDP, which meant that we could consume a bit more of ours. If, for some, if there is any reason why, going forward, Japanese savings decline and Chinese savings were to decline, where are the, the capital, the flows that will absorb uh, or will finance the Western economy's consumption? So maybe, I mean, I know it's no use for policymakers, but um, you can kind of see there's a problem because the, the global aggregate savings, it's, it, there may not be sufficient savings to go around given the objectives that governments have. And so, so what, is that, what, what does the pain look like from that? Where does that manifest? How well, does in, that manifest? in small open economies, you get balance of payments crises. That's what you'll see. You'll have sovereign problems. debt crisis. Uh, potentially, yeah, potentially. I mean, if it depends whether your currency floats or is fixed, or you try and manage it. But the first expression is a weakness in the currency. You have to have interest rates overshoot to persuade uh, global money to to hold your currency. 
Right. Um, so that's, it, that, that's it, the problem. Rates go up regardless of what the market is going to force rates up. Yeah. So it's a quite interesting to whether it's the front end of the curve or the back end of the curve. The front end of the curve is where central banks steer into the skid. The back end of the curve is where they try not to. And the market says, no, I'm not buying your bonds. Right. We used to um, call them bond vigilantes here, right? So William exactly. asked the question, do you agree bonds 20 to 30 years are not a buy until well into a Fed cut? Everyone's still thinking about the Fed cutting. Uh, I am dubious. It's true. I'm, I'm concerned. And uh, look, it's I can't tell you the number of times I'm wrong. My wife probably can, um, but I, I'm not as good at remembering them all. Um, however, I look at how our long ends are trading, and if you look at thirty-year sofa swaps, they're twenty or fifteen beeps away from the recent high. How is that meant to be going on? What's causing that if the Fed decided it doesn't need to hike rates anymore? Why are people, why are we dancing around the, the previous highs uh, now? So I, I'm, I'm not convinced that enough has been done. And I suspect, part, personally, I'd finger uh, fiscal policy for that. That fiscal policy is overly easy in the United States um, and it's going to stay easy. And we should think of that as... U.S. the U.S. consuming more than it should, as the government in this case chooses to utilize those savings for its objectives. So we we started the the uh, the program asking um, is everyone wrong about U.S. rates? The market's currently pricing in rate cuts still at some point. Many people think U.S. Treasuries have peaked, um, and that the Fed is is on hold before they begin that rate cut. Yes, they've been pushing the timing of rate cuts out, but still. So there are it's, great bearer arguments for the economy. Um, if, you're, if you've been watching the CRE discussion about what's going on in commercial real commercial estate. Commercial real estate, right. Um, you know that there's an awful lot of commercial real estate paper, which is not money good. Um, uh, the exact question is, is how much exactly? and who those losers are. In the past, it really matters when people lose a lot of money. Um, so when uh, Lehman's lost a lot of money or bondholders lost a lot of money in 2008, the solvency of banks was in question, which resulted in an autonomous contraction of a global dollar balance sheet or money supply, whichever phrase you prefer to use. Um, I don't really think that's an obvious problem now. And perhaps this would be like, this would be the clip of me that would be played forever. Oh, no, I don't think that's a problem. Turns out I was wrong. But uh, I don't see it. And These are all probabilities we talked yes, about. Right? That's They're right. all probabilities. This Every, is not investment advice or absolute crystal ball forecast. That's, that's right, guys. Take your, do your own research. Take your own risk. You don't want to lose money because I told you to. So, um, but I look at those potential losses. And I, I don't think people have any particular appetite to realize them now. Why would you? If you're the bank, why do you catalyze the loss and catalyze the requirement to have bigger reserves and tie up more capital for longer? You don't. If you're the borrower, why do you do it? Where I've seen borrowers um, default on loans, there was usually a catalyzing element, like a, mm. a much higher insurance premium, for example, in coastal markets. What you hear going on in Houston is a little ugly. What you hear going on in Florida is a little ugly. Um, but I suspect that the real estate market won't ride to the Fed's rescue. And the Fed will be left with rates a little too low relative to where fiscal policy is. Fiscal policy stays expansive. And we are left a little bit too long of bonds and wishing we didn't have them. Um, and at that point, we could reprice a long way. Remember, we just found out um, from the US Treasury that there's about a trillion dollars worth of, refin of financing activity in Q4. Um, in a couple of days, we'll get a better idea of what the financing policy for the US Treasury is. Um, those guys have been really smart. They've avoided adding duration to the long end, to the, to the bond markets in the US. They've done it all in T-bills. And that's just that means they've used up the reverse repo, which effectively is a whole bunch of cash they stuffed into bond markets that didn't need it. So we've financed federal government from that cash. Um, and but when they look to term it out, that's going to be quite a lot of duration to for the market to absorb. I would never say 
that it's uh, the auction the supply is going to result in higher rates. I think that's a silly thing to say. But I do think that while the Fed is trying to do QT on its balance sheet, and at the same time, pushing out a load of duration for us for the market to swallow, the balance sheet will, be, will become scarce, that there'll be a tightening in financial conditions. And that tightening is going to result in other assets cheapening up. Uh, I think by the time we get there, bonds might be plenty cheap enough to be bought um, by by the bond market. But what about other assets? Yeah. So if 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 in closing, Harry, what do you think is the biggest risk that's not priced in right now? I think the market is sensitive to yield spiking from here. I don't think people are positioned for it. I think people assumed it was impossible, um, and that we we come to the end of the cycle and the inflation is has bottomed, uh, sorry, it is still falling. If inflation hasn't still fallen, people are going to be embarrassed and that's going to hurt a bit. Um, and it will cause wider problems. It'd be some collateral effects. Although I suspect if fiscal policy remains accommodative, um, it won't be a huge crisis. It's when they try to tighten fiscal policy that everything will break simultaneously. Oh, so we have we're buying ourselves some time until that, but 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 uh, we will consider ourselves warned. Harry, it's always so much fun to have you on the daily briefing. We got to get you on more often. I don't know. I, I think I could do with losing some weight before I appear. Every time I see myself, <laughs> in it, I think to myself, "You need to lose ten pounds and grow some hair." That's what I think every time I see myself. We'll we'll take you just as you are, Harry. <laughs> And I mean, it is it is an incredibly difficult job you do wrangling those those two who who heap abuse on you the whole time. By the way, no, no, they they're all very nice to me while the calls on. It's just when they when we go dead, that's when uh, the abuse starts. <laughs> Brian, it's all very sad for that. me. <laughs> <laughs> we have witnesses. Don't worry, we have witnesses, Harry. No, seriously, th- thanks so much, Harry. It's fantastic to see you. Um, that again, um, Macro Insiders is on once a month on pro and we will be doing just everyone a town hall on rv 2.0 on the ai aspects of it tomorrow with raul and christopher from our ai team so be sure to join us for that i believe it's 11 o'clock but brian will make sure that i'm right about that i'm I'm hosting it i better be right i'm pretty sure it's at 11 um so hope you can all join us for that in the meantime everybody take care and good luck out there